Hello, good evening. Here we go again. It is Wednesday night. It is the 9th of September 2020. Time is really, really flying. It is The Late Show with me, Mark Willits, and my son, Jack. Hi, I feel really privileged to be here. Can't wait. Oh, brilliant, Jack. We did a little bit of pre-recording early, didn't we? Mm -hmm. A new program coming out. Yeah. And uh, how do you think it went? Yeah, it went well. I feel this will be easier in comparison because that was yeah. 28 and a half minutes just talking to a camera, not knowing how much I've got left. But I got through it and hopefully it'll through. be a, a blessing to some people. Yeah, good stuff. I'm oh, really proud of you, mate. Well, tonight you're going to really need your grey matter working at full speed, mate, because we've got a heavy subject which divides a lot of people. A lot of people get really, you know, quite uh, shirty about it all. And, um, but I think you've got a nice little take on it, Jack, haven't you? Tonight's programme is basically about Calvinism, Arminian, Arminianism. Did God choose us? Is it irresistible grace? Is it, you know, total depravity? Did we choose God? Have we got any part in anything? And et cetera, et cetera. Give us an overview, Jack, of what you believe. Yeah, so I want to talk about election and predestination because this is something that really played on my mind for a couple of years when I was in secondary school and going into university. And I thought I really had to find the right side on this. And I listened to so many debates. There's been debates here at Revelation TV with James White and Michael Brown and both so convincing. But if you look at the biggest passage on election and predestination in the Bible, which in my opinion is Ephesians 1, that really goes into it in detail, I think we'd actually, most Christians would agree, I can point out some things today and actually we'd be in agreement. So there are points of debate which um, we can cover today if the emails go in that direction. Um, but really I wanted to highlight some of the points where we can be in agreement and be encouraged by it, be blessed by it, and not just always think about the points of debate. Because I'm, I'm often someone who looks at all the points of debate, tries to get to the bottom of it, but sometimes you miss the bigger picture and miss the real blessing in the passage. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Jack, funny enough, we've just been out for a, a meal, haven't we? And um, tell the viewers what's happened. It's been quite funny, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> quite a moment. <laughs> so um, I fall heavily on one side of the argument, although, although I actually spend a lot of time in churches on the other side of the argument. I'm, I try not to be divisive over this. But I think I might have finally brought my dad round to the biblical side. Um, <laughs> right, that's it, I'm out of here. After many years. Um, but this is a point where I think there are great people on both sides. And the sides tend to be Calvinist and Arminian. And there are some people in between. You used to normally be in between. Um, but I'll just read a few names from both sides, just so you realise this isn't stupid people against clever people or wise people against fools. There are great people on both sides, even though I am on one side. Um, I'll just read a few famous Calvinists. So you've got Jonathan Edwards, the great American evangelist. George Whitfield, the great British evangelist. Uh, John Owen, John MacArthur, Charles Spurgeon, he was a Calvinist. J.C. Ryle, George Muller, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And then on the Arminian side, well, I'll, I'll say the non-Calvinist side, because a lot of Arminians don't like to come under the term Arminian. Um, you've got people like John Wesley, Billy Graham, A.W. Tozer, uh, John Goodwin the Puritan, D.L. Moody, uh, G. Campbell Morgan, R.A. Torrey, Leonard Ravenhill, and all the people in them lists I really like and have been blessed by. Um, so it really shows this is something that is possibly up for debate, but there's definitely great minds on both sides. So I always remind myself to stay humble. Um, and I, I've been on both sides of the argument. In, when I've been studying it, I've become Calvinist, then Arminian, then Calvinist. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to get stuck in. And do you know what, Jack? We, it's, in the Christian walk, it's good to have good sound doctrine. You need good sound doctrine. But like in all walks of life, there's always going to be differing opinions on the same, similar texts, aren't there, you know? And, and that's just, it's just the way it is. I mean, Professor Michael Brown, Huge intelligence, huge intellect. James White, huge intellect. John McCarthy, huge intellect, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, these people are just in a different league. They, they really are, and they're theologians, and they, they dissect the word. Um, but you can only go with what the Holy Spirit shows you at the time, can't you? You know? Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what we try and do. And never, ever be divisive about any of this sort of stuff, whether you be, believe, whatever it is, you know? The only things that are, are absolutely not up for grabs, you know, virgin birth, deity of Christ, etc., the resurrection. If you start veering off on all those sort of areas, then, then you know you're in a bit of trouble. Mm. But um, no, we've just had a really good, good uh, time in the, 
in a restaurant, mate, and we and um, yeah. yeah. So um, we've been looking at Hebrews 11 a bit in a couple of programs we have. we've done, and if you look at them, it's all about heroes of the faith, and it's not a list of the best theologians in the Bible. It was the people who had a lot of faith and put their faith into action. So I might disagree with a theologian from the past, but they might have still been a man or woman of faith. They might have put their faith into action. So why would I cause division? There's some things where I'd say, no, that's too far and we need to maintain doctrinal purity. But there's some things where I'm happy to disagree, even if I'm strongly opinionated. But, you know, Jesus says, they'll know you're my disciples by the fact that you love each other. Um, so we should show love in our um, response yeah. to other Christians, even if they disagree on some things. Absolutely, Jack. I was just thinking that phrase, uh, that I think it's in Galatians, I think, not sure, uh, faith works through love. And at the end of the day, uh, if, if we have none of those things, love is the key, faith is the key, putting it into action, you know. And at the end of the day, if you're saved, you're saved, great. And if you're not, we invite you to literally seek, seek while, you, while the Lord may be found, he says, you know. The Lord died, resurrected, and he's going to come back soon, and time is really, really short. So little programs like this, make the most of them, because as I said on the pre-record earlier, um, we not, may not be around for too much longer. So, um, you know, <laughs> while the Lord may be found, seek him quickly, because the days are very, very dark. Email us live at revelationtv.com or send a little text on 07860 Got one here from Ricky, Jacko. Um, Ricky says, hi. If limited atonement is true, then that means God specifically didn't die for some people, making God arbitrary, question mark. That means that perhaps God hasn't died for me or you and could have just given us um, effervescent grace to deceive us. I've never heard of, I mean, I know what effervescent means, but I've never heard of that. Have you heard of effervescent grace? No. No. <laughs> I've heard of provenient grace, but I like the word, Ricky. Um, can you discuss limited atonement further if you understand my point? Thanks from Ricky. What's yeah. that? What does limited atonement mean, Jack? So limited atonement is a Calvinist doctrine um, or a reformed doctrine. And it basically is the idea that Jesus only died for the elect. And I don't believe in limited atonement. Um, so I'm not a Calvinist. Although some Calvinists will believe in most of Calvinism and just not that point. Um, but they'll say, God before the foundation of time he chose who he wants to save, and he, and he sent Jesus to die just for them. And I would disagree. Um, for me, when I was looking into Calvinism and Arminianism, this was, for me, the easiest point to tick off straight away because there are some scriptures that I have found too clear on the topic. A very famous one, and it's very simple, is obviously John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It says there, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say, for God so loved the elect. It says world. And it's possible that world could mean something more specific if the context suggests that, but there is nothing in John 3 um, to narrow down world. So if God loves the world and sent his son, that suggests that his son died for the world. Um, there are other passages. Um, such as Isaiah 53, verse 6, let me just go there, where it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it says we've all gone astray, but the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. All cannot change definition in the same sentence. So if all have gone astray, the whole world has, every single human being has gone astray, has committed iniquity, has sinned against God. And it says that our iniquity has been laid on Jesus. Um, so for me, that clarifies that this all means the whole world, yeah. because the whole world has sinned against God. And I've got another all for you here, Jack. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Yeah. So is that another all that means the same as the other all? If you know Definitely, what I mean. yeah. yeah, and that's specifically salvific grace. It's grace to do with salvation because yeah. some people say there is a general grace, but then there's grace for salvation, and a Calvinist would say that's just for the elect. But here it says it's appeared to all men. And um, I'll just go to one or two others. Yeah, go on, Jack. John uh, chapter 1, verse 29, says the following. Um, the next day... 
He's talking about John the Baptist. He saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's John the Baptist talking about Jesus. And he says that Jesus takes away the sin of the world. To me, that sounds like the whole world. That doesn't mean everyone's saved, because I believe Jesus died for the whole world. But you only receive that when you believe. So before I believed, I was not saved, even though Jesus died for me. But it's when I received his death and resurrection, received that gift that I became saved. And we obviously received it by faith. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about that. And I'll just go maybe just to one more, just to really drive home the point and make it clear. Um, there's quite a lot of good passages to go to, so I'll just pick one more. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Um, let me find that right at the end. It says, talking about Jesus, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. To me, that seems to clarify it. Propitiation means that Jesus died in our place and satisfied God's wrath. Mm. And he's, he put himself in the place of the whole world on the cross. And now if you receive that by faith, God's wrath is not upon you. Yeah. Um, so I think it's quite clear from scripture that Jesus died for the whole world. Some great men of God would disagree. Um, but as far as I can see in scripture, Jesus died for all of us. Yeah. I'm going to wish you to the Old Testament, Jack. Isaiah 55, 11. Uh, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, okay? But it shall, shall accomplish that what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Um, the effectual call to salvation, Jack, when God sends his word, it works, and it does what he pleases. So how does that fit in with an Arminian sort of point of view? Um, where's the passage that says that the word of God is sharper than any... Hebrews 4.12? Hebrews 4.12. Um, so, yeah, you were saying that if God's word goes forth and achieves exactly what it wants, yeah. then if it's it saved some people, then that's what God wants. Yeah. It doesn't save anyone, that's what God wants. Yeah. Um, but it's not the word that saves, it's God who saves. By, we are saved by grace through faith, and it's God who saves us because it's God who sent his son to die in our place. What does the word do then? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So the word is able to pierce us, is able to convict us, and the Holy Spirit works through the word. Yeah. And there is a verse, I think, in John where it says, um, Jesus says he will send the Holy Spirit who will convict the world of righteousness and of judgment and sin. And of sin. So the Holy Spirit works by the word to do these things. Mm. Now, it doesn't save people by the word, but it convicts and it, um, it enables us to be saved. Yeah, in it the end. quickens us. Yeah, exactly. And it's all about how do we respond. Um, and I believe that you can resist the Holy Spirit some people believe you cannot resist the Holy Spirit, and maybe we'll get onto that later. Yeah. But yeah, that's the point of the word. Good stuff, Jack. Actually, we, what was the verse you showed me in the restaurant about people that were resisting the Holy Spirit? Jesus moaning about the Pharisees, wasn't it? Yeah, in Matthew... Um, Remember where that one was, Jacko? Matthew 23. 37. I think so, yes. Um, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So he's saying Jesus really wanted Israel to be saved, and Israel rejected the Messiah. Often in the Old Testament, Israel was disobedient, and God punished Israel as a result. Jesus, you really see the heart here. He wants them to be saved. He says, why, why are you not willing, like your fathers before you? So we see the heart of Jesus. He wants them to be saved. Then why are they not? because they have rejected um, salvation, they've rejected the Messiah. Yeah. So we see here there is an element of choice, um, and they've rejected him. Good stuff. Jacko, um, our little friend Lee, watching. Lee, God bless you. She really enjoys us on a Wednesday evening. You two are great keeping unity. Thank you, Lee. Big shout out to Josh and Ephraim. Hope you guys are all right. Great seeing you the other day, Lee. Good stuff. Um, got one here from June. Hello, gents. There was one great 
um, Calvinist leader you missed out. He studied with John Calvin in Geneva. Um, he was the founder of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, and his name was John Knox. Ah, born in Haddington, 20 miles south of Edinburgh. Bless you, June. John yeah. Knox, I know that name. John Knox was a very powerful preacher, and he went and studied under John Calvin, I think, in Geneva. Right. And he was so impressed with the setup in Geneva that he wanted to go and um, do it in Scotland as well. He was certainly a great man of God, although we wouldn't be in agreement on this point, but I still greatly respect his work in Scotland. Wow, brilliant stuff. Mike says, uh, can you go to Matthew 22, 14, Jacko? Matthew 22, 14. And it's the old classic, I love this line, for many are invited or called, but few are chosen. I wonder if you could unpack the meaning of this, please. Thank you from Mike. Yeah, so this is the parable of the wedding feast, and it's a parable about the kingdom of God. So it's, it says that in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding for he, feast for his son. So it's talking about God preparing a wedding feast for Jesus, and how does it work? And you see that they called Israel, um, but Israel overall rejected it, and the son were obviously saved, but as a whole Israel rejected the Messiah. So then he goes to anybody, it says anyone you can find, let me see the verse, um, verse 9, go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. So that is God's desire, invite everyone and anyone, all are welcome to come. But someone gets kicked out. Um, from verse 11, but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So God calls everyone to his kingdom. But why are some people kicked out? this man did not have the right wedding garments. Mm. And we read in quite a few different places, Revelation as well, it says um, about how the saints keep their garments white, white and they've been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. So everyone is called, but who are the ones who are allowed into the kingdom? Those whose robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. So if you want to be part of God's kingdom, if you want to spend eternity with God, with Jesus, who died for you, wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb. That means you acknowledge that you're a sinner who needs saving and you look to Jesus who died on the cross for you, who rose again three days later and you say, I receive forgiveness from you because you've taken my wrath on the cross, you've taken my judgment, you said it is finished and therefore I can believe in you and be saved. And the Bible does say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So that is the difference. That is how God chooses people. God chooses those who believe to have everlasting life and every spiritual blessing. Brilliant, Jack. If you go to Ephesians 1, mm -hmm. let's have a little look at the uh, main text. Yeah, so the main text for tonight was Ephesians 1, because that, for me, really gets to the heart of the matter. And there are three main um, points to look at. Um, first of all, when does predestination and election take place? Who is elect? And what are they elect to? What are they predestined to? Um, and when you look at it like that, the passage, I think, becomes quite simple. So we see in verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So that's quite easy. When did election take place? When did predestination take place? Before the foundation of the world. That is when God decided what would happen. I won't say what would happen yet, because I want to let the passage speak for itself. Okay. Um, but point one is predestination happened before the foundation of the world. And then another quite simple question in the passage is, who is predestined? Who is elect? And we see the answer in, first of all, in verse 12. It says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So it's those who hope in Christ. Another word for them is believers, Christians. And then it says in verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the ho promised Holy Spirit. So it's those who believe in him, believe in Jesus. 
And this is all quite similar. We would all agree on this. You know, all Christians would believe that predestination was before the foundation of the world and that those who believe, who hope in him, are predestined. And if you read Ephesians 1, you will notice, I think about 13 times, is it says, in him, in him, in Christ, in Christ. Um, verse 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, it's us who are in Christ. So those who are in Christ are predestined. Um, and then maybe after a couple of questions, we can look in more detail at what we're predestined to. But so far, we've seen that before the foundation of the world, believers, those who hope in Christ, those who are in Christ, are predestined and elect. And, yeah. does, that, does that mean they're actually chosen to believe and others aren't chosen to believe? Let's get down to the why here, because I can see what they're, you're saying they're chosen to, you know, believe for and what, what blessings they're going to have. But does God choose what, who's going to choose him? That's the crux of the matter. That is where uh, the difference of opinion is, yeah. And spoiler alert, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it says in Ephesians chapter 1 all the different things we're predestined to. Loads of different things. It's a really glorious message, but not one of them is to believe. He doesn't say that some are predestined to faith, some are predestined to believe. So if the Bible doesn't say that, I, I don't believe that. Um, it says that those who believe are predestined to all these glorious things. Right. But it doesn't say if anyone's predestined to believe. I think that is a choice. But I also think that we're only able to make that choice because of what God has already done for us. He's, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, so he seeks us out. He says, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So he draws us to Christ. Jesus says, when I'm raised up, I'll draw all peoples to myself. So he draws us as well. The Spirit works in us. The Gospel is the power of salvation God, for those who believe. God unto salvation. Power of God unto salvation. So God has already done all this work in us. He's already sent Jesus to die for us, to rise again. Um, God has made it possible for us to believe and to be saved. If he hadn't done that, I think we'd be happy in our sinful state. We would never look after God. Yep. Um, Romans says that. Um, none are good, no, not one. None seek after God. No. So in our natural state, we will never seek after God or want to be saved. But by God's grace, we are drawn to him and now we're able to respond. Right. I'm going to nail you down a bit more just to get to the crux of the matter. So you told us about us being predestined to, you know, these blessings, etc. But literally, verse 4, Jack, just as he chose us in him. Mm -hmm. now, I can understand what we're predestined to by his foreknowledge. But it says here that just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that says to me, I'm playing someone's advocate here, mm -hmm. uh, that says to me that he chose. He, he chose who would believe. Okay. And by, and by a natural extension, chose who wouldn't believe. Yeah. Where do we go with that one? Well, first of all, it doesn't say that he's choosing people to believe. Yep. This specific verse says that he chose us that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we can all agree on that, that believers are chosen to be holy and blameless. And that's true. I'm now holy and blameless because of what Jesus has done. Yep. Not in my walk, but in my position. Yep. Um, so that's, it's not chosen to believe. Um, but he does the choosing. So people say, oh, so does it mean that we've chosen and not God? But saying God hasn't done anything, God hadn't... It has to be God who chooses because it's God who... Uh, created the world, sent his son into the world. It's Jesus who died on the cross, Jesus who rose again. It's God who makes all these blessings possible. It's God who sets up the kingdom. So all, the only choosing we've done is by saying yes. I say yes to your blessings. I trust that you are God and what you say is true. So therefore it's God who does the choosing and he chooses those who believe to inherit his kingdom. Yeah. Wow. You've studied this, haven't you, mate? You really have. Right. Um, go to John 6, Jack. There's a couple of scriptures in there. John 6, is it 48? The very typical, um, those Calvinistic verses in John 6, Jack. There's quite a few. I was a Calvinist for a time, and John 6 was one I would it's go to. One, was it 48? Um, start, 37 is 37. the first um, yep. Calvinistic one says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I'll never cast out. 
Mm. So that one, there's a few. Um, I will lose million. none of them. All, all the father gives me, I will lose none of them. Uh, what verse is that? Um, can't see it, but I know it's in there. Verse 39. I uh, can't see it. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of what he has given me, yeah. but raise it up on the last day. Um, well, who is given to Jesus? Who is being raised up? The next verse says, verse 40, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him yeah. should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. So once again, what's the difference? What's the condition? Belief. Those who believe will be raised up on the last day. Those who believe are kept. And I think as long as you're a believer, as yep. long as you're trusting in Christ, you are 100% safe. No one can snatch you out of God's hand. Now, if you stop believing, if you turn from Christ and reject him, you've left his hand. You've walked straight out. Yep. You're a sheep who's gone astray. And God will pursue you. He doesn't want to lose you. Um, but certainly, if you are a believer and you keep on believing, you'll be raised up at the last day. You're 100% secure. Um, it does say those who endure to the end shall be saved. Yeah. So you have to keep believing, keep enduring. Yeah. But he fuels that belief, doesn't he, Jack? It's his faith that he gives to us as a gift, isn't it? I don't think there's a verse that says faith is a gift, although it is in a sense because, like I said before, we can only believe because he's drawn us and, yeah. and done all this for us. Yeah. Um, some people would say, but hang on a minute, doesn't... Ephesians chapter 2 say that faith is a gift. Um, so I'll go there now. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, it is the gift of God. So some people say, Ah, oh, faith, it's, not to do with, it's nothing to do with me. It's purely from God, it's a gift. But faith in Greek is feminine. And when it says, And this is not your own doing, this is neuter. And if anyone studied foreign languages, you know that the genders have to match up. So if it's a neuter this, it can't be referring to a feminine faith. Grace is also feminine. So it can't be referring to the grace or the faith as a gift. It's the whole package. It's salvation, which is by grace through faith. Yeah. That is a gift. Doesn't mean all components are, it means salvation is a gift. Wow. Which is by grace through faith. Good stuff, Jack. Oh, brilliant. Right. Um, Lee says Hi, Mark and Jack. We really look forward to this show read recently in the Bible that we are to go and preach the gospel to those who haven't been chosen so that they might be saved. Sorry, I don't know where it is, but I'm sure Jack will know. I must admit, Lee, I've never heard that, that line. We're to preach the gospel to the hoes who haven't been chosen. I mean, I must admit, I've never heard of it. I've it might be, it might be reading a different version. I'm pretty sure. So that they might be saved. Yeah. Um, there is a um, thing where it mentions about people that might be saved. In Acts, um, where is it? It talks about um, God setting borders. Um, I think I've written it in the front of my Bible somewhere. Um, Acts 17, verses 26 to 27. says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Um, that's the only one I can think of where we might be saved. He's put borders in place and nations in the hope that people will look to him and be saved. Yeah. So that's another one that suggests he wants all to be saved. Yeah. And he wants all to be saved, that's his hope. Um, that won't happen because a lot of people reject the gospel, but I can't think of one exactly like that. Yeah, gotcha. Sue says, Jack, why does it say in Ephesians 1.4, um, uh, why does it say in Ephesians 1.4, question um, mark, I do obviously, I presume it's believed, Jesus died for the whole world. Love to you both from Sue. What's Ephesians 1.4 about, Jacko? Um, so I'll give a bit more of the picture at large. That might help. So it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we see here it's before the foundation of the world. That's when we were predestined. Who's predestined? Those in him, in Christ, believers. Yeah. So before the foundation of the world, believers were predestined to be holy and blameless. And we, we can all agree on that. It was God's desire. We, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's basic. That's level one Christianity. We know that if we believe, we're saved. 
we're now declared holy. We're now declared blameless because Jesus has taken our blame on the cross. Um, so that's all it's saying. It's actually, this is a gospel message with a focus on the future. Gotcha. Yeah. So if we look at some of the things we predestined to, um, we see in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Mm. So who is it talking about? Those in Christ, once again, we see that throughout. Those in Christ are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So what are we predestined to? Verse 3 says, every spiritual blessing. Verse 4 says that we should be holy and blameless. Verse 5 says, he predest so it says, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through yeah. Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So it's because of God's love that he's made this possible, and I believe for everyone. But those who are in Christ because of their faith, they are adopted as sons. And I think sometimes we don't really realise how great that is. We've not just been saved. It's not like if I drag someone out of a pond and they're drowning and then just save them and then walk off, I have no relationship with them. They don't know me, but at least they're saved. Salvation with God is much more than that. He saves us from our sin, from condemnation, from hell, and he actually adopts us into his family. He makes us his sons. Yeah. And Galatians um, chapter 4, I think, says that we are made sons of God. And the reason it just says sons and not sons and daughters is because it was the sons, the firstborn normally, who got the inheritance. And we see here in Ephesians 1 that if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, you've got the whole inheritance. You inherit eternal life. You inherit every spiritual blessing. You become a son. God is now your father. We now have a spirit in us that cries out, Abba, Father. Yeah. We can pray to God. He listens to us. He loves us. That's why it says in verse 4, in love he predestined us. Um, so that is a really great truth. And that is why I wanted to say that actually, even though there are these points of division, the core of the message, all these things we're predestined to, being blameless, holy, adopted as sons, every spiritual blessing, we actually agree. Yeah. And that is the glorious truth of Ephesians 1. Every spiritual blessing is now ours. Wow. Often we lack material blessings on earth and we struggle. But like we said before in previous programs, we look into that heavenly kingdom, that heavenly city. Yeah. Um, that's why we've got every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's where we should be looking. All stuff. Jack, often in the Old Testament, people um, refer to God as a bit of a tyrant. You know, there's plenty of death. Blood, guts and gore all over the place in the Old Testament. Let's go to God's heart maybe in Ezekiel 33, if you can whiz over there now. You quoted this one earlier on when it was at the restaurant. Ezekiel 33 and 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure... Howard loves this verse, doesn't he? He loves coming out. I don't know. Yeah. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, but why should you die, O house of Israel? Jack, you were saying earlier about um, Esau and Jacob. Jacob, you know, that, that famous verse, mm -hmm. Esau I've es Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. How does that match in with this and what you was also saying about um, the promise? Not just people, individuals, but nations and promises. How was you working that in earlier? Well, there's a lot in there. Um, yeah. I love this verse as well because Israel is rebelling against God, as throughout the prophets they tend to do. Um, but you see, it's not God's heart in this, in their rebellion. He's not predestined them to rebellion. He wants them to be saved. And he's saying, uh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And now some people, not all Calvinists, but some people, a small group, say God rejoices in saving these and actually has made other people for damnation. Mm. Here it says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't want the wicked to perish. He wants them to be saved. Um, he says, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. That is the call of God to those who are perishing. Turn back, turn away. And it's only if Jesus has died for everyone, it's only if salvation is for everyone, um, if that is possible. Because if you turn away from your sin, well, if you're not elect, if God hasn't died for you, then you've got nothing to turn to. Yeah. There's no salvation to turn to. There's no cross to turn to because Jesus hasn't died for you. Salvation isn't for you. And if you go to hell, 
You can't regret rejecting salvation because it was never really offered never to you. Never really offered, yeah. But I believe that salvation is offered to everyone. That is why God calls them to turn back from their evil ways. He says, for why will you die, O house of Israel? They don't need to. God has given them a way out. It's like he says in, um, is it Numbers or Deuteronomy? He says, I'll give you two paths. Oh. Was it Josh Joshua, yeah. maybe? Yeah, choose in the Old life. Testament. <laughs> choose life that both you and your... Yeah. Your family shall live. Yeah, and he literally says, I, I give you two paths. Yes. We have to choose life. And his desire is that we all choose life and that we join his bride and his kingdom. Yeah. So then what do you do with verses in Romans 9 where it says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's in Romans 9. Romans 9, yeah. First of all, that is um, a Jewish idiom. So if you say, this person I've loved, this person I've hated, it's about showing favour to. He's shown favour to Jacob. He's, he, the promise has gone through Jacob. That's why we talk about the fathers, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Yeah. And now Romans 9, which is often discussed when we're talking about um, this topic, Romans 9 is actually about the promise. Um, it's not about flesh, but promise. So we read at the beginning of chapter 9. I won't read the verses because it's quite long. But he, Paul is basically in anguish saying, you know, I will read it because it's not yeah, that Yeah, it long. does make sense, actually, if you read at the start, yeah. From Romans 9, verse 1, he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So Paul is saying he's desperate for Israel to be saved but they've rejected the gospel and now they're lost. And he says, they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Can I just say, if you're watching and you don't believe that Jesus is God, here it's very plain. According to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all. So just a side note there, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is God overall. Um, but he's making clear here, yes, they're lost, but it makes no sense because they're the natural inheritors of all these promises. Yeah. To them belong all these things, the law, the adoption, the patriarchs. Um, so that's the situation introducing Romans 9. But then in verse 6, Paul says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring uh, be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So God promised to Abraham that he'd make him a nation, give him a land, and through him all the people on earth will be blessed. And that's through Jesus the Messiah that they are blessed. But if Israel has rejected this promise, then how is God's promise to Abraham still in that, uh, valid. And we see that Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham. Yeah. And this is the first point. It says, I've chosen Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael was the son according to the flesh, but Isaac was the son according to the promise. promise. Yeah. So God's promise goes through Isaac. And then the next point is, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Esau was the firstborn. Um, and we, we know the story about how uh, Jacob um, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob because he wanted some of Jacob's soup. Um, foolish thing to do. And now the promise goes through Jacob. Jacob, yeah. Jacob now gets all the favour. Jacob gets all of these promises. And now that doesn't automatically mean he's saved. Here it's not about salvation of individuals. It doesn't say, therefore I saved Jacob and not Esau. Therefore I saved Isaac and not Ishmael. Because then it goes to talk about Pharaoh. Pharaoh was unsaved before he was hardened and unsaved after being hardened. So it's not about who's being saved on an individual basis. It's yeah. about who does the promise go for. It's so Abraham, then Isaac, though he wasn't the son according to the flesh, then Jacob for the same reason. Yeah. So God's promise still stands because it's not according to flesh, but according to promise. And that is why even though Paul is sad because Israel has reje rejected the gospel, it has come to Gentiles we see later on. Um, let me find the verse. Um, um, it's run away from me. Oh yeah, here it is, verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, 
that is a righteousness that is by faith. Faith is the key. In election, predestination, faith. Um, but the Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. So if you're looking at Romans 9, saying, how does that fit in? That's a confusing one. It's about God's promise being by promise, not by flesh. It's by faith, not by works. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Jacko. OK, we're going to get through some emails and texts now, because they're coming in really nice. God, uh, Joy says, God does not want anyone to perish. So that's from Joy. But that all should come to repentance. I'll just throw my own quick question here, Jackie. If God doesn't want anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance, and God is omnipotent and all-powerful, doesn't that make him a weak God if he's not able to save everyone? Um, no, because he's given us a certain level of choice. OK. Yep. He wants us to choose life. I lay behind, give you before you two parts. Choose life. So it's not to do with weakness. He could literally zap people and say, saved, 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 saved. Yep. But that's not how he works. It's we're saved by grace through faith. We must believe. Amen. That's uh, so our little mate Frankie from Belfast. Hi, Frankie. Really hope you well, mate. Hi, Mark and Jack. Doing a great job, boys. Romans 9.15. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Keep shining bright, lads. Frankie from Belfast. Thank you, Frankie. And just a little reminder for myself, really. Um, Genesis 18.25, I think. Shall not the God of all the earth do right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, if we can't work out and do all the maths and work it out and this, that and the other, he will do right. Amen. Which is a nice thought to relax on, isn't it, Jack? You know? Yeah, definitely. Brilliant stuff. Right. <laughs> he makes me laugh. Right. Um, 1 Timothy 2 from Les, who desires... 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge... There's that word all, Jack. Yeah. and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Thank you, Les. Lots of use of the word all tonight, Jack. And like you were saying earlier, context is key, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what's that little phrase? Um, a text out of context is a pretext. Yeah. Where did that come from? I've heard that before. A couple of preachers do say that, yeah. yeah. But it is true, you need to read things in context or otherwise you can prove any doctrine. But that yeah. verse, 1 Timothy 2, 4, is proved elsewhere in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but... Oh, I've lost a verse. But that all should reach repentance. That is God's desire. He wants all to repent and be yeah. saved. Bless you. Thank you. Right, we're going to talk to God. We're going to God's own country, uh, East Yorkshire. Angela, really enjoying the show. Mark and Jack, so enjoying Jack's interesting topic. Very enlightening. What a blessing you both are. Thank you. You are truly appreciated. Angela, that means the world, isn't it, Jack? That's really, really lovely. Really lovely stuff. OK. Um, hi, Mark and Jack. Anita says, lovely to see you both again. It's such a joy to have a young man with such a strong faith. In Revelation, in Revelation 14, what does it mean when it talks about the Lamb on Mount Zion with 144,000 with the Father's name on their forehead? God bless you both. Anita. That, that 144,000, that's an interesting subject. <laughs> I've heard about 35 different answers to that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Jack? I've recently changed my opinion on this. Yeah. I used to think that it was talking about literal Jews. Yeah, because... that's where I stand. I, I think that's, that's yeah. where I stand. And there's room for debate because, in my opinion, it's not really clear-cut. Um, but it says in Chapter 7 of Revelation um, that it's 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then it lists the 12 tribes. But then in chapter 14, it says that um, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And if you consider that the unsaved have a 666 on their foreheads or their wrist, which is the mark of the Antichrist, yeah. well, then those who have the mark of Christ, of God on them, um, surely that means the saved. And then if you look at the description of them, it says in verse 3, they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Who are the redeemed? Believers, Christians. Um, it says, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. And then later on, I think in this same chapter, it talks about um, people who kept themselves from fornication. Yep. And in context, it's talking about those who go off with um, Satan's 
uh, wife, the great prostitute, yeah. uh, harlot. the harlot, harlot yeah. um, which is Satan's kingdom. So basically they've kept themselves from Satan's oh, kingdom. kingdom. Yeah. And it says, it is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And their mouth, in their mouth no lie was found for they are blameless. Who are blameless? Believers. Yeah, we're holy and blameless, aren't we? So before him. personally, I think it's talking about um, believers with Christ in heaven, talking about all believers. Um, and then just one last point on this. It does say in Revelation chapter 21, it's talking about the new heaven and the new earth. And it says in verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So the 140,000 and 12 tribes. But then it says in verse 13, um, no, in verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you see in the new creation, you've got Israel and the church united as one bride, as one city, as one kingdom. Yep. And I think that's the same with 144,000 Jew and Gentile in Christ, all united one together under the Lamb. That's good to me. Ingrid says, hi, Mark and Jack. What a blessing to have somebody who thinks for himself instead of just taking what they're told. Good on you, Jack. Shalom from Ingrid. God bless you, Ingrid. He's never took a blind bit of notice of what I say. <laughs> and that is what I absolutely love. That's great stuff. Um, Doris says, hi, first time I listened to your son. He's so clear, goes straight to the point, easy to follow. Thank you very much. Great program, you two. God bless. Thank you, Doris. Really sweet. That's really, really lovely. Lovely people out there. Mark, how blessed you are to have a son like Jack, full of the grace of God. God bless you both from someone called N. Just the letter, the letter N. N, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, do you know what? Let me just make this clear. Um, Jack has never asked to be on TV. He's never asked to present, come anywhere near the studio, never been asked, never asked to present a show, never asked to do anything God has called him. So I'll just let someone know out there that, remember Paul said to Timothy, do not let anyone despise your youth. All right, I'll just give that someone a little reminder because I've never asked Jack to come here. God has opened the doors and he's walked through them. And uh, I've taught him absolutely nothing apart from Calvinism, which is now refused. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And pre-tribute. God, God has brought him here. And, um, yeah, so just give the guy a break. Right, great stuff. Hi, Jack. Sorry to disagree. John 15, verse 6 says, You did not choose me, I chose you. And that is from Myra and other verses stating the same. Sorry. That's quite clear, Jack, isn't it? John 15, 6. Mm -hmm. You did not choose me. This one always makes you smile, this one, because it's very stark. I chose you. Blessings to you both from Myra from the Scottish Highlands. And if you are disagreeing with me, you're perfectly entitled to do that. You don't have to agree with me. Um, but let's just remember, we all believe in Jesus, that he yeah. died on the cross for us. He's taken our punishment. Um, so if we're Christians, we can agree to disagree on this. Amen. Um, but he's talking to his disciples and he's saying to them, you did not choose me, I chose you. And we see that in some of the Gospels near the beginning, where he just goes to them and says, you know, come and follow me. And they get up and follow him. They didn't choose to be disciples. They didn't choose to be an apostles. Paul, at the beginning of a lot of his letters, says call to being apostle or chose to be an apostle. So God's called them to a position. And now have they responded? Yeah, they responded in faith. They, they agreed. But that's not about salvation because Judas was also chosen to be a disciple. And Judas, obviously, was not saved. Ended up dodgy, didn't he? He betrayed the Messiah. So yeah, that's what that's about. Thank you, Jacko. Hi, Mark and Jack. Thanks. Powerful and blessed again tonight. God bless you both from Cram. Bless you, Cram. Here we go. Um, what about the verse that says, many are called but few are chosen? We went there earlier, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Sorry, don't know where it comes from. Where did it come from? Forgot myself. Matthew 22. I think. Matthew 22. Thanks, Carol. Bless you. Um, right, here's another word, Jack. Foreknowledge, okay? God, knew, God knows who is going to be saved because of his foreknowledge but people have a free will as to how they respond to the gospel. Could it be that God has predestined those that are saved to do specific works? Um, we are saved to do specific works because we read that in Ephesians 2.8. Yeah. Saved by grace through faith, not as ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And we are, um, I've forgotten what the next verse says, verse 10, Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So absolutely, God has um, chosen us for that. But yeah, it is, um, foreknowledge does play a role. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, um, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, 
for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. So that was based on foreknowledge. And also in the famous passage in um, Romans 8, let me quickly get there. It says in verse 29, um, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So it's based on foreknowledge. And what were we predestined to? To become like Christ, to be conformed to his image. And that really sums up Ephesians 1. That pretty much does. Thanks, Jacko. Uh, great programme, John and Chris. We'd just like to say something we've heard a couple of times, that God sees all time from before the foundation of the world to the end of the world as one long line, and all the things in history and the future as a result of this, he already knows who is going to come for him to him throughout all the years. Blessings from John and Chris. Thank you, John and Chris. It is funny, isn't it? God, God sees, God's already at the end of history. He's, he's here now. He was at the past. He's, time is very weird. We have a linear time, don't we, Jack? You know, yeah. where it's just one straight line and we're only here at the moment. But the Lord sees yeah. if, from, he's already at the end of, of time as already, isn't yeah. he? As he's well. outside of time. Time only came into existence with space and matter in Genesis 1, verse 1. Wow. Um, thank you both so much. How encouraging to listen to this young man, Mark. He is a credit to you and his mum. He's making more sense of this difficult subject than many older teachers. He's obviously grounded in the word, inspiring. Thank you, Bren, from South Wales. Thank you, Bren. I, I tell you what, he puts me and Vicky to shame because he spends most of his life just, just reading the word and he's managed to squeeze in a nice little uh, two-one in French and German from Durham University. You, you've really worked your socks off, mate, and it's God's just giving you this, you know, compulsion just to crack on uh, mm. and go into places that, you know, I've, I've never really been. But, um, yeah, so there, there you go. Right, Dean, talking about uh, abortions uh, in the UK. Listen, if you've watched Rev TV for more than five minutes, you'll know exactly where every single one of us stands on that subject. And uh, it's getting worse and it's shocking. And, you know, we're all running, we're all running around the world shutting down the world economy and crashing the whole world to save us from a pandemic with a 0.2% mortality rate. I'll tell you now, there's massive more mortality rates in many areas of life which we do nothing about, and uh, I think that pretty much sums up my opinion on that. Um, yes, absolutely, Jacko. Jack, really enjoyed it tonight, mate. We're down to our last couple of minutes. Anything you want to finish up on? Yes, yeah, so we've touched on all of the points of debate, more or less, um, but I just wanted to remind people of what actually joins us is that God has blessed those who believe in Jesus Christ, those who hope in his son in Ephesians 1. And our future is glorious. We have a glorious present to an extent, but we're waiting for a heavenly city and we have been blessed. We've been made sons of God. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and we have eternal life. That is what we're predestined to. That's what it's all about, this glorious future, yeah. our inheritance in Christ. Um, so yes, we can discuss this, but let's fix our eyes on that. And in fact, yeah, we're, we're already seated with the Lord at his right hand in the heavenlies, aren't we? Yeah. So I remember reading Witness Lee's Sit, Walk and Stand. We are, we are actually already, our race is already finished. Mm. I know we're walking it out now. That's where tension in the Bible comes in, isn't it? We're, the situation's already done, but we're walking it out. But we've, we've, already, we've already won, we've already overcome. We win in the end mm. uh, because we're already seated with Christ and seated is a, a position of rest. The job is done. Yeah. Isn't that a nice thought? Amen. You know, that is a nice thought. Jack, I've loved it tonight, mate. Absolutely loved it tonight. Uh, you really opened my eyes and, yeah, you're a real blessing to me and Mum and hopefully a lot of people out there. Guys, we live in dark times. Um, we need to really hold on now. Uh, Revelation, I think it's Revelation 2.10 I mentioned earlier in my little programme, I pre-recorded, that we need to stay faithful even unto death. Things are starting to get very, very dark now, so we... Keep praying for us, keep praying for yourselves. We need to really seek the deep things of God now um, because things are about to change very, very uh, markedly um, and in a very, very big way. Listen, we may, not be here, we may not be on air forever, but get the word of God into your heart and into your mind because time is very, very short. I'd love tonight, Jack. Thank you so much. By the grace of God, guys, we will be back next Wednesday. Have a great week. God bless.